Dick Miller. I direct the program in Ethics and Public Life, and I teach in the Philosophy Department. And actually, uh, today's talk, the last lecture in our series, After the American Century, connects those two halves of me more tightly than one might expect. Uh, the connection was made by a philosopher that uh, all philosophers profoundly admire, uh, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher of the 18th century, in an essay that he wrote in 1798. Uh, it, had the title, Is the Human Species Making Progress? And for most of the essay, he offered troubling reasons to suppose that the answer was no. But then came a section entitled An Occurrence in Our Own Times, which shows that the human race is making progress. The revolution which we have seen taking place in our own times, in a nation of gifted people, he had in mind, the French, may succeed or it may fail. It may be so filled with misery and atrocities that no right-thinking man would ever decide to make the same experiment again at such a price, even if he could hope to carry it out successfully at the second attempt. But I maintain that this revolution has aroused in the hearts and desires of all spectators who are not themselves caught up in it a sympathy which borders almost on enthusiasm. If their aim, the aim of the revolutionaries, of a good and just constitution is recognized, the human race for all its frailty has guaranteed that it will make progress. Uh, every colleague who I talked to in philosophy about the courageous uprising centered on Tahrir Square in Cairo that overthrew the Mubarak regime thought of that passage by Immanuel Kant. We all were reminded by the bravery of those hundreds and thousands of people that for all its tortuous side, there is a certain nobility of which humanity is capable. And we were all led to hope that the ideal of democracy, an ideal to which the United States has contributed substantially for all of the failings of American politics, we were led to hope that that ideal of democracy had more future in the world than we had thought before. Uh, by the same token, the political crisis in Egypt now makes us worry about the global fate of democracy, and maybe it makes us worry a bit about the capacities for progress <coughs> of the human species. Ellis Goldberg will be giving the last talk in the series after the American century. I think it's profoundly appropriate that he is given the role of the gifted people he knows so well in determining the fate of democracy in a central part of the world. He has illuminated the struggles of this great people for freedom going back over a century and his reports on the political crisis in Egypt now. He has brought his, his learning about the past and present to Egypt to bear in providing essential information about that great struggle. Chantal Thomas of the law school will introduce you to him in detail, and then he will talk to us about democracy and discontent in Egypt. Now is the winter of our disillusion. <coughs> It's my humble honor to introduce Professor Goldberg, um, and thank you for including me in this event. I congratulate you and your colleagues on putting together such a successful lecture series. And it's such an asset to our community here at Cornell, and we're really pleased that we managed to convince Ellis to fly transcontinentally to join us in concluding the lecture series. 
So the title of this talk is Democracy and Discontent in Egypt, Now is the Winter of Our Disillusion. And I myself am very grateful for the work uh, that Professor Goldberg has completed over the years. I recommend to you among his influential writings uh, the book Tinker, Tailor, and Textile Worker, Class and Politics in Egypt, and also the book Trade, Reputation, and Child Labor in 20th Century Egypt. He is a professor of political science and international studies at the University of Washington and is an eminent historian of the interaction of politics, society, and economics in Egypt, especially among Egyptian workers, and he's, of course, a leading commentator on the current crisis in Egypt. His reports on the current situation, partly based on his own visits, have been published in the magazine Foreign Policy and elsewhere, and have been a crucial resource for many of us as we follow the events. <coughs> um, so I want to leave as much time as possible for your remarks, Ellis. So um, please join me without further ado in welcoming Professor Ellis Goldberg. OK, well, that's very loud. Um, I wanted to thank the Cornell Program on Ethics and Public Life, and especially Chantal Thomas and Richard Miller for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, as it always is for every speaker anywhere. It's always a pleasure to be, the, to be there rather than where you came from. But in my case, it's actually a very special pleasure to be here because my late colleague Dan Lev got his PhD here. Dan was one of the outstanding students of Indonesia, Indonesian democracy, and played a very important role, I think, in... Um, the study of, and in some ways, the recreation of the rule of law and democracy in Indonesia. So from my point of view, it's actually wonderful to be on the campus uh, that nurtured such a remarkable moral sensibility and intellect. <clears throat> I'm going to talk more about Egypt than I am about U.S. policy, mainly because I know more about Egypt uh, than U.S. policy, but also because it seems to me that to talk about the rest of the world it's actually useful to know something about the details of life in the rest of the world, rather than focusing on theory and assuming that you can fit sufficient details in to make it work. So the winter to which my title alludes obviously has very little to do with the Arab Spring. It's profoundly English. It's the opening lines of William Shakespeare's tragic history of the Wars of the Roses. And that long and irregular conflict to unify the English state under the tu Tudors is probably now better known to Americans through George Martin's Baroque prose rendition in The Game of Thrones than through the Shakespearean drama, to say nothing of the writing of actual historians. But the modern state was born out of the dynastic clashes Shakespeare describes. Unfortunately, those dynastic clashes probably don't tell us much about Egypt, although they gave me a great tagline. And our experience of the modern world makes much of a period in which politics was a raw conflict for power, very difficult to understand. But that may be what we're looking at in Egypt now. In addition, I think we have a real problem in the US today understanding events in the Arab world, because in the 1990s, the academic uh, the academy began to have an interest in democratic transitions, especially peaceful transitions to democracy, and pretty much abandoned the pursuit of understanding revolutionary violence as the progenitor of democracy, which had been the research program in the 60s and 70s. And unfortunately, the experience of Eastern Europe is not very useful either for understanding events in the Middle East today. So, <coughs> It's not surprising, then, that neither Shakespeare nor the transitological accounts of disorder prepare us for understanding the Arab world today, but they're especially uh, useless in understanding one of the most striking features of the last three years, the one that provides, I think, the most difficult political and moral problems for imagining the events and appreciating them, the role of mass public demonstrations. Um, the nearly canonical statement of our puzzlement is this cover of Time magazine, uh, which in the summer of 2013, in the wake of a petition campaign, um, 
calling for new elections, which brought hundreds of thousands of Egyptians into the streets, told us that Egyptians were the world's best protesters and the world's worst Democrats. Now, Times editors were not the only ones to counterpose demonstrations to democracy. The noted Harvard Law constitutional expert Noah Feldman used his regular column for Bloomberg News to write a nearly hysterical attack on demonstrations, uh, calling them essentially a form of mob rule and the antithesis of democracy. I want to suggest that there is a profound tension rather than a simple antagonism between the right to assemble and the necessity of delegating authority to representatives, which are two very different ways of understanding uh, democracy in our world. The right to assemble and speak is, to my mind, more fundamental to democracy than the right to vote. And I'm evidently not the only person to believe that. Dictatorships throughout the 20th century rarely abolished elections, but they inevitably res restricted and severely restricted the right to assemble and speak. And in fact, I think we could say that one obvious indicator of whether elections are free is whether candidates and their supporters can freely assemble. One favorite restrictive device around the world, and certainly imposed by the British in Egypt, but retained under successive Republican governments, in fact, was to forbid more than a few people to meet, or to insist that a certain distance exist between individuals in public space, so they were not, in fact, having a demonstration. And it was this prohibition that gave rise to the very impressive silent stands in the summer before the collapse of the Mubarak government when people would assemble, but they would keep two or three feet between each person uh, so that they were not technically violating the law uh, on assembly. In early 2011, ordinary Egyptians and state officials quickly realized that the dynamics of demonstrations involving tens or hundreds of thousands of people are very different from those involving only dozens or hundreds. And in fact, for me, it was quite remarkable being in the midst of a demonstration, the size of which I had not seen since the anti-war demonstrations, to realize that Egyptians had no experience with the relationship of 100,000 people in the street to the police. They had only experienced the relationship of a few dozen people to the police. Trust me, it's a very different relationship. So officials and observers who find small demonstrations manageable, polite, and even desirable find them far less pleasant when they are orders of magnitude larger. And that's true even in the United States. August 23rd, uh, 1963, today, sorry, August 27th, 1963, today is remembered largely for Dr. Martin Luther King's famous address. But at the time, what instilled fear in Washington officialdom was the thought of hundreds of thousands of primarily African-American demonstrators in the streets of the nation's capital for the first time in history. And indeed, there had never been such a large march in the nation's capital. So the tension here between assembly and voting strikes me as important, but it's a tension, not an antagonism. And I think it profoundly illuminates the problem of democracy before and after the military coup. And to the extent that we can talk about it later, it also illuminates the immense difficulties in trying to craft an American foreign policy that will further democracy in Egypt, if indeed that is what either the American public or American foreign policymakers actually want. I'm less clear about that. So perhaps the best place to begin looking more clearly at the struggle for democracy and Egyptian discontent and disillusionment would be the events of February 2nd, 2011, better known as the Battle of the Camel or the Events of the Camel. Four days after demonstrations in Tahrir Square had begun, supporters of the old regime stormed into the square in the late afternoon in an attempt to oust the protesters, and the largely peaceful area was suddenly turned into an urban battlefield in which signs, paving stones, and bottles, but thankfully not guns, were used. I'm going to spare you the well-known photographs of young men whose livelihoods depended on tourism attacking demonstrators. A few men on camels and horses actually would have had little effect on the hundreds of thousands of demonstrators demanding Mubarak's ouster. What mattered was the prolonged and intense street fighting between pro and anti-Mubarak demonstrators using paving stones, fists, and debris from nearby construction sites. 
It was the thousands of Mubarak supporters who streamed into the area on the largely deserted elevated highway that runs across the northern end of the square and toward the Nile who threatened the protests. And for two days, Tahrir and its environs, as far as another square um, hundreds of meters away, Tal Harb, were a battlefield. And the role of the army in this period, the army that has said that it's protected the revolution, was to stand aside and to essentially let the two sides fight it out. The demonstrators at that time received the army's neutrality uh, as a positive uh, feature because they were afraid that the army would intervene on behalf of the old regime. Um, had the pro-Morsi demonstrators forced their opponents out of Tahrir, it probably would have been the end of the uprising. And here's a picture that I took. Uh, you can basically see uh, the army armored personnel carrier there at the entrance to Tahrir. And what was rather striking, I have a whole bunch of these, uh, army guys just going about their business, uh, guarding their tanks or their armored personnel carriers, while 100 yards away, there's uh, intense fighting. Sorry, OK. Now, if demonstrations were the single most potent revolutionary instrument of the last three years, there was a rhythm that has largely gone unnoticed outside of Egypt. Commonly, for the first two years, it was attempts by the old regime to repress demonstrations that brought more people out. Sorry, okay, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my text here. So what, I'm, what I want to get at is that there would be protests, and then at some point the regime would try and repress the protest or push people out of Tahrir, and that would bring more people out. And this was unexpected because unexpectedly then the repression increased the size uh, of the protest. And it's well known that more people turned out for the um, demonstrations on the 28th of January after there had been an attempt to repress the 25th than on the 25th. And it was the unexpected ferocity of the attacks on protesters that shocked many Egyptians uh, into the streets. And I think I've got the right... Okay. I may need a... Okay. Let's see if this. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll just skip this. Okay. Um, maybe you can help me get to the next slide. Okay. Well, okay. This is kind of not working very well. Okay. Okay, so anyone who lived through these days will have vivid memories of the streets of downtown Cairo filled with tear gas, spontaneous anger directed at the offices of the ruling National Democratic Party, and of the surprise that Egyptians felt when police fired on demonstrators. And what I was going to show you but don't seem to be able to get is a video clip that pretty much went viral of um, a guy in Alexandria who opens up his coat, walks to a, in the direction of a bunch of policemen and is shot dead on the street, uh, probably, uh, what, 20 yards away from them. Um, it's a very uh, remarkable video. So it's hard to imagine, as I say, um, a democratic government that doesn't allow uh, demonstrations. And yet the problem with demonstrations is massive demonstrations have the potential to shake public order and, in fact, to overwhelm the established routines of government. So we're happier with the notion of massive demonstrations when they're against authoritarian regimes, and we're happier with them when they appear to be against uh, policies uh, that we all agree are, are bad. We're also happier when they dominate the streets for a day, but then everyone politely goes home, uh, than when they stay in the streets uh, overnight. And here you can just get a sense of the, I'm sure you've all seen these kinds of photos of the size of the crowd, uh, what may have been less uh, obvious in the United States was the degree to which during the p first week of the uprising, certainly there were attacks on police stations and on vans that carried police men around. So this is uh, a police van and it says this is the end of injustice and the government rather quickly cleaned these things up or as quickly as they could in the wake of the massive protest. Um, I suppose if it was up to me, this particular truck would still be there as a kind of a monument to the events of uh, the uprising. Uh, 
So the tensions inherent in democracy as full participation in politics, majority rule, and equality of treatment became more apparent by April 2011 when another set of mass demonstrations occurred, one that are perhaps more problematic for us to think about. Uh, these amounted to a revolt in the upper Egyptian city of Enna. On April 14, 2011, the then Egyptian Prime Minister Issam Sharaf reshuffled the deck of provincial governments, and his choice for the new government of the upper or southern Egyptian province of Enna was met with, merely, with nearly immediate and widespread protests. Sharaf had chosen a police general to be the new governor, a man named Imad Shahata Mikhail, who is a Coptic Christian. And to some degree, what these protests brought into the open was a set of issues about whether the national government was able and was seen to be able to resolve some of the most basic conflicts in Egyptian society, like figuring out who would be the governor, like establishing that Copts can be governors over Muslims, um, and also trying to resolve the particular issues in a declining economy of making local government run. Within hours of the announcement of Mikhail's appointment, and well before similar complaints about governors occurred elsewhere, protesters gathered. And appointing new governors seems to have been a decision by the government to respond to concerns that the revolution had not changed the personnel of the uh, old regime. So what the new government did was simply to reshuffle the personnel in the hopes that people wouldn't really notice that governors were being moved from one province to another and would accept that as being new. Some of the early reports of the unrest in Enna describe a demand to replace Mikhail with a, governor, with a governor who was both not a police general, but who was also a Muslim. And the demonstrators themselves were frequently described, at least in the Kyrene press, as Salafiin, or Salafis. Now, it's usual to describe the Salafis as rigorous or extremely orthodox Muslims. Um, its adherents often claim to adhere to an originalist reading of the Quran. I'm not sure what any of these words mean, uh, as Bernie Haeckel of Princeton points out, the notion of the Salafis may, Salafis may simply be connected more by a particular theology than by a political outlook. So in the same way that in the United States, um, Jerry Falwell and Martin Luther King are both, both Baptists, uh, we can't really read their politics off their theology. Uh, this may also be the case for many Salafis. It may be more useful to say that they aspire to wrest the power to interpret texts uh, from established authorities without necessarily focusing on the content of that interpretation. And there's also a tendency in the United States uh, to draw a bright line between the Salafis who are clearly the bad guys and the Muslim brothers who are clearly the moderate guys. Um, Egyptian observers such as the late Hussam Tamam would have said that wasn't a very plausible, realistic, or useful distinction, uh, and Tamam would have said that, in fact, there was a significant Salafi uh, current within the Muslim brothers themselves. So we have our particular ways of looking at the rest of the world, and the rest of the world may not always look quite that way to itself. Whatever name we want to use, it's clear that in many parts of Upper Egypt and elsewhere, there are Salafi groups that practice what they claim is a pure form of Islam, and who seek to subject the entire population, especially Christians, uh, but also other Muslims, to their own political and social rules. Um, they have frequently opposed the concept of citizenship because it allows non-Muslims to govern Muslims in a predominantly Muslim society, and also women to govern men. Uh, and they've also opposed, in the past, the notion of democracy, although recently they have come to notice that they can actually win elections, which seems to have changed their vision um, about the role of democracy. Now, opponents of the reason I'm going through this is, this was a very diverse political group of people who were mobilizing religious and other sentiments to try and prevent the government from imposing its own particular choice of a governor on this province. This was a convenient opportunity, and as we know, democracies have never been short of demagogues. There was also dissatisfaction in the Christian community at Ayub's performance as governor in a previous era, and a concomitant belief that a Christian was simply in a weaker position to enforce the laws. That is to say, the Christian community would find it hard to rely on a Christian who had to deal with Muslim opposition to enforce the laws governing the equality of Christians. So 
during uh, the tenure of the previous Christian governor, a terrible crime had occurred in the city of Naga Hammadi when a drive-by shooting at a church uh, after Christmas services took several lives. And again, this is kind of complicated. Uh, there were early cl claims that the shooting was a form of revenge uh, for a sexual relationship between a Christian man and a Muslim woman, uh, but investigations by human rights uh, organizations suggested that really what was going on was a rather cynical attempt by a member of the ruling party to manipulate sentiment so as to win an election. Um, it's very difficult to get to the bottom of these things, as you know, in general, and as a consequence, in the city of Enna, with a generalized set of mass demonstrations that had taken control out of, of the city, out of the hands of the government, waiting to try to uncover uh, the truth behind all of these details was a little bit hard for the government to do. Now, in the end, what happened was the previous governor, Adel Labib, who's a Muslim, was simply reappointed to the post. Now, there's another, kind of yet another dimension to this particular conflict involving, as I say, mass demonstrations. And that is, thanks to the late Samra Suleiman, we now have a much better picture of Enna itself in these years. And as the financial crisis of the central Egyptian state deepened in the 1990s, it withdrew from supporting local government, especially at the governorate level. So governorates were left to their own devices to come up with resources to fund public projects. And in the highly centralized state of Egypt, this had repercussions because it forced governors to go out and find new sources of revenue. And they could either do this through mobilizing the private sector or through more intensely trying to use the state authority to pick up fines and taxes and the like. Now, it turns out that the previous governor, who was a Muslim, had done an especially good job of generating income to support public projects in Enna and turned it into what Suleiman describes as a European city on the Nile in Upper Egypt. That is to say, a clean and well-run, uh, efficient city. And he accomplished this through expanding the efficiency with which the state assessed fines, fees, and other revenue sources. So, why did I go through all of this, you're saying? What's, what, kind of, I've lost the thread now. Well, the point here is that these events in Anna force us to consider some very difficult questions about democracy. If democracy is a way for people to increase collective control over their own lives, then the demonstrations that paralyzed the city and cut train traffic between northern and southern Egypt is simply a useful tool for local people to establish some control over their own lives. Uh, and they certainly had the right to assemble and to protest the authority of the state. And we certainly would believe that in the situation of an authoritarian regime or a recently collapsed authoritarian regime where there are as yet no free representative elections, what other, sort, what other form of protest or attempt to use their influence would people have? And again, more to the point, don't people always have the right to assemble uh, for a redress of grievances? And lastly, to what extent, though, on the other hand, is the state, even when it's acting in an arbitrary and authoritarian manner, responsible for ensuring a norm of equality? That is, maybe the governor that they appointed wasn't a particularly great guy. Maybe it was still a, mili a military-run state. But doesn't the state at least have the, the obligation to ensure that it can appoint um, Christian authoritarians as well as Muslim authoritarians? It sounds funny when you phrase it that way, but in fact, if, a, if equality is a norm, then that would also be a kind of an issue. So we have to confront these uh, kinds of issues. I'm not gonna, there's no answer. I can't come up with the answer. What I can say is that as Egyptians look at the problem of democracy and try and figure out how to respond to the imperatives of democracy institutionally, these are the kinds of problems uh, that they face. And crippling demonstrations showed that the power of the Inuit population was real, but that that power uh, was really uh, ambiguous. And I think that we have problems dealing with this in the American academic setting. Uh, my friend and colleague Jason Brownlee from the University of Texas in a recent report for the Carnegie Foundation recently dismissed this incident as one of sectarian conflict and focused simply on the uh, meaning of it as replacement of a governor. But the problem is that the original call for demonstrations and their prolongation was precisely a complaint that the state was imposing a Christian on a population that didn't want him. Now, 
there's one last kind of, and yet, yet again, there's yet another last little wrinkle here. Because you might think, based on what I've just said, that the town of Enna is a hotbed of anti-Christian agitation and anti-Christian feeling. And yet, and I'll show you later uh, some maps on this, as it turns out in the 2012 presidential election, the area of Enna, for the most part, did not vote in favor of the Muslim Brother candidate, but voted in favor of the candidate who represented the old regime. So, if I, I, we can simply say, well, this is a lot more complicated than it appears to be on the surface, and I think that's actually a good place to start. But what it means is, if we want to think about crafting American policy toward a country where, as, as all countries, politics gets to be pretty complicated and pretty much uh, emerges at the local level, we're going to need to think about what's actually going on on a day-to-day -day basis at the local level uh, before we begin to craft one-size-fits-all foreign policies. So, let's move on then to the elections themselves. There's no doubt that having won the 2012 elections, uh, Mohamed Morsi was the legitimate president of Egypt. But the election itself in the context of revolutionary disorder, and I prefer to think of the last three years as a period of revolution rather than democratic transition, suggests that his mandate was more fragile than it appeared. And I don't raise this as a moral uh, judgment, but as a political observation. Things that would have been, I think, quite feasible or reasonable in another time and place, after perhaps years and years of what political scientists call the consolidation of democracy, may not be that feasible in the midst of a violent transformation of state institutions. So, in the context of ongoing political upheaval, the question was, what did the election to the presidency mean? Now, surprisingly, with the elections, we noticed something over the last two or three years, which is a change not only in votes against the Muslim Brothers and Islamist parties, but also in the beginning of a withdrawal of participation in voting by large numbers of Egyptians. Now, part of this clearly has to do with voting fatigue. Anybody, after there had been something like um, five elections in the space of two years, could get a little tired um, of voting. But one thing that's rather interesting about the presidential election is that millions of supporters of the Muslim Brothers and other parties in the earlier parliamentary elections abstained in the presidential election, that is, didn't vote. And this is very peculiar because usually people are more likely to vote in presidential elections and less likely to vote in legislative elections. The president, after all, is the big cheese and the, national, uh, the nationally prominent figure. And certainly in Egypt, that was the case. And yet, we don't find that happening. Now, this is a map of the of voting in the 2011 constitutional referendum, which was uh, overwhelmingly Egyptians voted in favor of that. And that was uh, trumpeted by the Islamists and to some degree ever since by their supporters as the first indication of massive Egyptian support uh, for these parties. Whether it means that or not is not terrifically clear. We're, we'll put that aside. We can talk about it later. Now, Gonna, some more numbers, I don't expect, there won't be an exam, so we're, we can all go home safely forgetting what I'm about to say. The Freedom and Justice Party, headed by uh, Mohamed Morsi, collected more uh, than 10 million votes in the parliamentary elections. And yet Morsi himself won about half that number, 5.5 million votes in the first round of the presidential elections. Again, that's very peculiar. A lot of people who voted for Morsi's party in the parliamentary elections didn't show up to vote for him in the presidential election. About 7.5 million Egyptians voted for the Salafi Noor party in the legislative elections, but the guy who was running as the, a liberal Salafi, if you would, uh, Abdelmanam Abdel Fatouh, uh, only got about 4 million votes in the presidential election. So there's a drop-off here. Um, had Morsi won the same number of votes that went to the Freedom and Justice Party, his party, and had he won half of the Salafi votes, he would have won the presidency on the first round. There would not have been a second round of voting. The, the, again, this is pretty remarkable because all of those votes, this isn't, I'm not making this up, this isn't a what-if story. All of those votes were there. 
Egyptians went out in sufficiently large numbers in the legislative elections to give Morsi the victory in the first round of the presidential election. And then they didn't go out in that same number in the, in the first round of the presidential election. And uh, Shafiq, his opponent who represented the old regime, had been Mubarak's last uh, prime minister and was a general, would have won something like um, 5 million votes out of 29 million had all of the people who voted in the parliamentary election showed up for the presidential election. In, in other words, Shafiq's, vic Shafiq's showing would not have been at all remarkable. He would not have been able to challenge Morsi into the second round had he, uh, got, had he gotten had the number of people voted in the presidential election who voted in the parliamentary election. So this is very peculiar, and we don't have much of a good way of understanding this. Now, what we do know is that in wide sections of the Delta, people turned on the Muslim brothers. And the, this is the 2012 first round. So the blue is uh, the vote for Shafiq, the old regime candidate, the pro-Mubarak guy, and the red is Morsi. And the green is another candidate, a Nasserist, and then there's some other smaller candidates. And what's very striking about this is the geographic localization. So what we're looking at is a center of the country, literally the center of the country, Cairo and the central delta provinces, going for the old regime candidate, for whatever set of reasons, and the periphery going for various revolutionary candidates. And let me just show you this. This is the area south of Cairo. It's often said that the south of Cairo is you know, more backward, more religious, um, more Salafi than the north. So th that looks okay if we look to the south. Here we have a prov province called the Fayoum. It goes overwhelmingly for Morsi. Uh, the entire uh, area of the Nile Valley there clearly goes for Morsi. And then something else happens as we go further south, which is, oddly enough, the countryside becomes less pro-Morsi. Right? The colors are getting lighter especially as we're getting south. And then when we get all the way to the south, Enna, Luxor, and Aswan, we find something completely different. It's almost flipped. Now, there are lots of different kinds of explanations. I'm not, I don't, I'm not myself for the moment concerned with how we explain this. I simply want to point out that this electoral map, again, suggests to us a very different notion of what that election meant to Egyptians than it's often presented in the American media. So one thing that it might mean, by the way, is that people in the Delta who live on, uh, who, who don't have land, who own their own farms, were more likely to vote for Shafiq, and people who are uh, rent from landlords were more likely to vote for Morsi. So what we see in all of this, then going forward, is the constitutional referendum at the end of 2012. And this is a little, this is like maps of the United States. It's a little misleading because the really small provinces actually have rather large populations. So this big province over here, of course, is mainly desert. It's not filled with people. So what we see here is a map, a geographic map, in which 64% of the population votes in favor of the 2012 constitution and 46% um, vote against it, okay? Or 36% vote against it, sorry. So what we can see again is that same geographic distribution. Cairo and some of the Delta provinces are clearly voting against the Constitution. And voting against the Constitution is actually fairly extreme. I think very few people in general would, be, would think about voting against a Constitution. That seems to be something we just words on paper, it could look pretty good. Uh, most people are not constitutional scholars, and I would say that in several periods of being in Egypt, I only actually saw one person with an actual placard uh, that had a complaint about an actual um, paragraph of the Egyptian proposed constitution. I saw lots of complaints about the constitution, but I only saw one person who had a very particular uh, piece of the constitution that she didn't like. So, what we're looking at then is the emergence of some kind of a counter electoral force. And this counter electoral force is centered in Cairo, 
and it's also centered in the industrial cities of the Delta, especially a province that's called Garbia, uh, where there's a big textile center, uh, but also another town known as Tanta, uh, which has some other important um, features to it, religious and, and the rest. So pushing ahead, what happens as a result of these elections is a message that should have been clear, I think, to the Muslim brothers who had gained control of the presidency and a fairly weak legislature, that they did not have as much support in the countryside going forward as they had had in the past, that their support was declining, uh, and perhaps also that the role they could not rely in this situation on the legitimacy of the electoral process to ensure their stay in office. Not, again, I'm not saying that because I think it's a, I'm not saying that because I don't believe in elections, I'm saying it because that would be a lesson that you might want to draw given the unsettled situation. So, and in fact, in May 2013, the former judge and Islamist intellectual Tariq al-Bishri uh, pointed out in an article uh, for the Daily Sharuk, what he called two of the crucial mistakes of the Muslim Brothers. Now, al-Bishri is historically an ally of the Muslim Brothers. He was one of the very earliest prominent intellectuals to really go over to their side, to see them as an important historical force. He had served as a judge on one of the most important courts uh, in the Egyptian political system, and is a very well-known public intellectual. I, I would say in Egypt, a more prominent public intellectual than many of the people who I see quoted in the American press. Um, I'm not going to go into names, but it's not that they're not good guys or something, but they're just not as, uh, they don't have the gravitas that he has. So what he, and he also had been the person who was entrusted to write the amendments to the old Mubarak constitution that the military uh, had the public vote on. So he's a fairly prominent guy. And what he said was that they didn't seem to notice, their most important failing was their inability to notice the need to broaden their support rather than to gain control of institutions for themselves. And he also noted that they had made what to him as a judge was an especially egregious mistake. They had antagonized the Supreme Constitutional Court by allowing a deputy to propose a law that would have changed the composition of the court and stripped uh, the court of the ability to engage in judicial review of legislation passed by a supermajority. And Al-Bishri's point was, this was not a politically very astute move. He wasn't even, he himself, I think, found these objectionable on their own. But his larger point was, in the middle of the transition that we're in, this is simply not a politically very wise thing to do. And it's true that the Muslim brothers withdrew the bill, didn't let it go forward, but they had at that point uh, threatened the Supreme Constitutional Court, whose members were already very inclined to be antagonistic to them, and that created its own uh, dynamic. So when the Supreme Constitutional Court then was asked to rule on various laws uh, that were important to the Muslim Brothers, they began to rule uh, negatively. Now, I'm sure in their own minds this was not a matter of uh, revenge or tit for tat. I'm sure that, as is the case with most people in Supreme Courts, um, they simply look, what, what does Justice Roberts say? They, they don't play baseball, but they just looked at the way the ball came in and they either called it a ball or a strike. Uh, but the particular strikes that they called invalidated the entire legislature on which the power of the Muslim Brothers essentially rested. And Egypt is a particularly interesting place in that regard because it appears to be one of those places where a Supreme Court can not only invalidate one seat, but an entire legislature. So once they had done that, really, uh, they had thrown down the gauntlet, and it's at that point that a very fateful conflict begins to occur. Um, faced with the fear that the Supreme Constitutional Court was then going to invalidate not only the lower house, which it had done, but the upper house, and then the assembly that was writing the new constitution, President Morsi decided to issue his own constitutional declaration on November 22, 2012, where he denied the courts the right to engage in oversight, uh, made it clear that the committee writing the constitution could not be resolved, and insisted that he could undertake whatever was necessary to safeguard the, re the revolution. Uh, which I think as a political scientist I can say that the technical word for that was drove people nuts and created very profound uh, 
uh, polarization in society. And this is a more lighthearted look at that. I, um, I'm not going to show you slides of street fighting and people killing each other. I happen to prefer this one. Uh, basically, it's a, a new, newlywed couple uh, in the wake of Rabaa, but this is the same, it's the same thing that was already going on, where they're divided, basically, uh, about uh, Egyptian life, which side you're on. So Egypt had begun to become uh, highly polarized, and there was a growing sense of widespread dissatisfaction uh, with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood government. Now, <clears throat> there's something about the way this is presented in the United States, which, I, again, I find puzzling. Because in the United States, it seems to me there's a tendency to present this as a small westernized elite, which is opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood who represent the overwhelming majority of the Egyptian people. But the legislative maps that I've shown seem to suggest that that's not quite true. They do represent a very significant fraction of the Egyptian electorate, but it's a little hard to make the case that they represent the overwhelming majority of the Egyptian people. Um, it's also a little puzzling for me to think about someone who was a professor at Cal State University uh, and worked for NASA and whose two children are American citizens as somehow being distinct from the westernized um, minority. Um, what that suggests to me is that those particular ways of thinking about this are just not very useful ways. So what is rather useful, I think, is there's a conflict over power and over the direction um, that the state will go. And one frequently asked question is, if I'm right in, de in describing a declining uh, power of the uh, Muslim brothers, then why did the opposition resort to petitions and demonstrations? Um, it's frequently asserted that all the opposition had to do was wait, there would have been another election, and then the bad guys would have been voted out and the good guys, whoever you think they were, uh, would have been voted in. Now, this is often countered with the assertion that since the liberal elite lost every previous election, they were going to lose the next one, no matter how dissatisfied Egyptian, the Egyptian people were. And therefore preferred to stir the emotions of the mob, that is to say, to encourage people to demonstrate, or rather to engage in the more dignified and effective struggle for representation uh, through elections. Now, I don't find these debates, again, very revealing. Uh, I certainly don't happen to find reveal, re particularly appealing the notion that Egyptians didn't want to be governed by a so-called ballotocracy, uh, which guaranteed an unpopular party with an electoral majority the right to pursue its policies, because that's what I think elections are about. Uh, parties that are often unpopular do get to pursue their policies. But I also think that even once parties have, become, have been elected, they have to listen to other forms, non-electoral forms of public protest. So this goes back to what I, where I began, as T.S. Eliot would say, in our beginning is our end, mass mobilization. And for Americans, mass mobilization often has this frightening component. Uh, for people like Noah Feldman, it conjures up images of lynchings, of pogroms, or the rallies with which totalitarian dictators paraded their control. And people would even point, I think, to the demonstrations in Tahrir after June 30th as an example of that. Small demonstrations of conscience are, are much different. They're benign. Uh, we like the idea of a handful of freedom riders being beaten up by a group of thugs. Uh, we like the idea of a single Chinese citizen being run over by a tank in Tiananmen Square. Um, they affect our consciences, but they don't affect public order. Mass demonstrations, therefore, appear, like an, to, appear to be an inferior substitute for the courage of the individual speaking truth to power or the calm processes of the ballot box. But what I want to suggest is that's not a very accurate way to think about these things. In fact, mass demonstrations are an important tool for populations and for citizens to show their discontent with the policies of the government. And at that point, governments ought to listen. Noah, I think, is wrong to suggest that governments then have to do whatever the mass dem of demonstrators ask for. But they do have to respond. And one of the peculiar features, I'm going to wrap this up now, one of the peculiar features of the events <coughs> of the last four months was at no point did anyone consider evidently doing anything other than they did. So we could imagine, I'm very good at imagining, and I'm sure you are too, 
um, we could imagine President Morsi having responded to the demonstrations differently. He had a constitutional right to call referenda. It's a mystery to me, and I've actually talked to members of his party, why they didn't simply call a referendum uh, around this issue. Not so much because, sorry to be too cynical here, not so much because they actually thought that uh, the referendum would resolve the issue, but because it would have taken the wind out of the sails of the movement that was trying to bring about new elections and unseat Morsi. That seems to me to be exactly what you expect people in democracies to do. Uh, by the same token, another very negative feature of the events of the last three years, I think, is that Egyptians have become much more inured to violence. So in February of 2011, Egyptians were, many Egyptians certainly, were shocked and overwhelmed by the thought of Egyptians killing other Egyptians. Some of the same people who expressed that shock and dismay to me in 2011 were not at all shocked and dismayed by the violence uh, that occurred in the dispersal of the demonstrators at Rabah al-Adawiya and the murder of um, <coughs> hundreds, if not a thousand or more people. This seems to me to be quite negative and to suggest uh, some very unpleasant things. So, it seems to me that what we're looking at is, we can say it's an ongoing process, but the reality is that Egyptians have been struggling around some very important issues of democracy for the last three years. And the assertion that somehow, because demonstrations have been a prominent part of this, Egyptians are not interested in democracy, strikes me as being rather foolish. Let me just conclude by pointing out two things. Then we can go to questions. Um, <coughs> the first thing, is I'm not quite sure when people talk about democratic transitions and the failures of Egyptians, where are the remarkable successes? Uh, it's not clear to me that in Russia, the democratic transition, which has led to the same person being elected variously president and prime minister, uh, alternately with a compliant legislature that changes the rules so he can be elected to a new position that has complete power every time he needs to uh, to do that is a successful story of democratic transition. It's not clear to me that the Ukraine, uh, in which one former prime minister was jailed for ostensible, I mean clearly trumped up political charges, is an example of democratic transition. So I'm not quite sure where are the remarkable successes uh, to which people uh, are comparing this. But there's another aspect of this which I think is important, and I'm just going to conclude by comparing events today to events in 1952. In 1952, when there was a military coup, everyone agreed that parliamentary democracy and liberalism were bad. There was a pretty widespread belief that the old order was corrupt, uh, what Fifi Marceau called Egypt's liberal experiment was a bad idea, and that Egypt would be better off without political parties and sham democracy. This may seem like it's weak tea, but it strikes me as being important today that in fact, nobody's actually making that claim today. The claims that people are making and the arguments that people are having are more about who's really democratic. They're not about democracy isn't something that Egyptians want or isn't something that Egyptians would like to have. Uh, now, I'm not saying, therefore, that all of these claims are equally valid. I'm not saying they're all equally honestly raised. But it strikes me as important in today in Egypt that no one can actually get away with saying Egyptians don't want democracy in the context of Egypt. Okay. So it seems to me that if we're going to think about US policy, uh, that would be a good place uh, to begin. So. No, sure, I, or they can call in. The, we, can, we can have democracy, and you can call in yourselves. Uh, so, uh, Ellis will just no uh, demonstrations. call on people, uh, just would you speak up when you are called on when you on liability of this auditorium is that uh, you can hear us in front uh, very well. It's hard, hard for people to hear one another in the audience. So, we welcome your questions and comments. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your talk. Your argument seems to be that the Muslim Brothers miscalculated, that they should have, in this struggle for power, they should have looked at these, the, the data they got over time from these five votes and seeing that their support wasn't as deep as they thought and was probably declining over time. And somehow Morsi miscalculated, and there was a series of errors which you, you went through. 
Um, they should have realized to look the data closer. There was an inability, there was a failure to broaden their report. Instead, they opened the controlled institution. They alienated the Supreme Court, his constitutional declaration, his people off. It was a series of mistakes. And so I think of two narratives that you commonly hear. One would be critics of the Muslim Brothers that would say, this is unsurprising. This is, Morsi wasn't really the decision maker. This is an organization that's been underground for 60 years, and it's a secretive cabal of an inner core that's unelected that was really making the decision. So of course they're going to miscalculate. And what they wanted to do was seize power. If you had a Muslim Brothers supporter here, what they would say is they didn't miscalculate. They saw the writing on the wall. They saw that the institutions of government were not going to allow them to rule. They weren't providing social order. Lines were backing up at gas stations. The bureaucracy was basically taking a vacation until the next election. And so they did the best they could by trying to not seize power, but control whatever institutions they could to get the government working again. And so they didn't miscalculate at all. They didn't miss the information. They, had, they were looking at it at a different time horizon. They realized that the need in the long run, their adversaries were undermining them, not through the ballot box, but by hindering their ability to govern. So I, I was a little uncomfortable with, you're, you're, you're almost arguing that there, there was a cognitive block on Morsi, and he just made mistakes, he fumbled the ball. When I think there are these two different narratives that are probably different ways of framing it. In my sense, the Muslim Brothers knew their support was declining. They were doing whatever they could to try to hold on to whatever power they could. Okay. Um, uh, first off, my own sense is uh, we actually know, um, my own particular take on it is that we know almost nothing about the internal workings of the most important institutions in Egypt. That would be the army, the judiciary, and the Muslim Brothers. Although we know more about the judiciary than the army or the Muslim Brothers. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I actually think I suppose I would say that the story is probably a little bit more complicated than that from my point of view, in that I would have, I myself expected, and to some degree actually hoped, that Morsi would emerge as a more personally autocratic, authoritarian president than he was, and would have, in fact, uh, become more interested in the perks of the presidency and less committed to the Muslim Brotherhood. And it turns out that Morsi was a man of remarkable integrity. Um, in, as a member of an organization, he continued to abide, uh, I think, by what the organization uh, thought. But that seems to be, unex that's kind of unexpected um, in many ways. Uh, and I, I think in some ways it turns out to be problematic. I don't, about whether they understood what was going on, it's, again, it's hard to tell. When I talk when I've talked to them occasionally, and when I read things that Nathan Brown and Mark Lynch write, it's not clear to me that they actually, what they understood. Uh, it's also not clear to me to what extent they were able to come to an agreement about the political situation. I mean, one problem that strikes, that strikes me is I don't know exactly where or how the Muslim Brothers do what a communist party in this situation would have done, which is have a party conference, expel the people who made the mistake, and come up with a different line. Um, which would be the standard way of resolving this kind of an issue, um, and not have to deal with the, the more uh, problems of narrative that you raise. So um, that's another issue. But it seems to me that you do have a small group of people who took control of this organization. Not, this is not actually what I really deeply study, but I, it seems to me you have a small group of people around Shatter, Badia, uh, Morsi, and a couple of others who came to dominate this organization in the period between 2007 and 2009 or 10. They have managed to alienate or oust most of the potential alternative leadership. So Habib and Zafarani and Abdel Fattouh in various ways um, and became a more cohesive, um, what, a more cohesive leadership body with their own particular ideas, and I don't think we know very much about that, uh, they clearly began to think that their major, one of their major problems in terms of elections was appealing to people who were part of the Salafi voting bloc. Um, I can't really quite understand uh, their concern with many of the cultural issues that they, that took up their, um, their time in December of last year without that. So I'm not sure that it's quite as coherent as you want to make it. Um, just a question about uh, demonstrations and how they've changed over time. I'm wondering if you can talk about the character of demonstrations after the events of the summer, 
It seems to me, in the beginning of the revolution, um, the idea of, of assigning a, a political intent to a demonstration was much more difficult than it became over the summer of 2013. In particularly, I think, uh, July 26th, when CC asked for a, a tafweed, a, um, a delegation from the public to give him authority to pursue terrorism, according to his words. Um, and then there was a demonstration that responded to that call from the government to give him the legitimacy he needed to pursue the Muslim Brotherhood demonstration. So it seems to me like that is a, a crucial turning point in the role that demonstrations play, where they no longer become um, as, for instance, the, the Ida demonstration in 2011 was a way for demonstrators to use their, their influence to regret, redress their grievances with the state, but, it, but, the, but the demonstrations themselves now seem to be folded into uh, the state, no longer as a means to redress grievances, but as a, as a source of um, state legitimacy or, or democratic le le legitimacy, especially in the absence of elections and a, and a parliament like we have right now. So I wonder if you can just talk about how demonstrations have changed from 2011 to now, especially after the events of this summer. <laughs> Yeah, I, there's, well, I, I think it actually goes further back. I think there's a, there's a different kind of, a, I guess, I don't know, way of thinking about demonstrations as spontaneous and less spontaneous. And at different moments, different political forces have tried to argue that their demonstrations are important and genuine because they're spontaneous as opposed to organizationally put together. Now, almost all demonstrations have some sheer organizational component. But to go back to November, the dueling demonstrations between the Ikhwan and, um, or the pro-Morsi and anti-Morsi forces, it was very important for the left uh, or the liberals or whoever they are in November, late November of 2012, to say, well, our demonstrators were spontaneous. They just showed up. And their demonstrators were bussed in and then they went home. Um, that's a variant on what, of what you're talking about. So it seems to me that the demonstration, the Tafweed demonstration, which I would say is different, by the way, from the June 30th demonstration, which seems to have been quite spontaneous and occurred without the direct intervention of the army. Um, those kinds of demonstrations are the kind that authoritarian regimes don't, don't like and don't allow. Calling people out into the square, um, uh, that would be more like, okay, the classical, I guess, fascist demonstrations uh, in Europe. Those are different, but those are really not, I, I suppose to the extent that we can think of these things as being self-organized, those are clearly not self-organized. Those are organized by the state. Uh, those don't represent uh, an assembly for the redress of grievances. They don't represent that quality of petitioning the state. I, I, in fact, I would say if I think about it, it's precisely the, tough weed is precisely the delegation of authority as opposed to petitioning the state to do something that you know its leaders don't want to do. So that would strike me as being different. You're certainly right that the Egyptian government in the wake of the coup wanted to use demonstrate or public presence as a way of legitimating what it was about to do, that's certainly, that's certainly correct. But what, what's also very clear, I think, is they understood what a dangerous weapon that was to wield. Dangerous partly because they couldn't control its effects on society at large, and dangerous because they couldn't tell whether it would turn against them. I mean, when you, get, when you get hundreds of thousands of people into the streets, you can't really be sure exactly what's gonna happen next. So there, I think, that's why they've only done it once. They, they're not likely to do it again. And in fact, the events of today strike me as being kind of important in, that, in this respect. Um, the government just, the Egyptian government just put up a monument to the uh, people who had killed um, two years ago, claiming that it's their defenders. And in fact, in the ensuing uh, hours after the public uh, dedication of this monument in Tahrir Square. It appears that hundreds of people uh, descended on Tahrir Square for the first time um, in months and months and destroyed the monument. Uh, as a, so uh, it seems to me this story isn't quite over yet. Uh, it's not at a happy place right now, but it's not clear to me that it's over. And it seems to me that, the, again, that assembly of people, now I don't know if that's a mob, I don't know if that's mob rule, I'm sure that destroying public property, I know it's a crime in Egypt, um, and I'm sure that it's a bad thing to do in general. 
Uh, on the other hand, it seems to me this is precisely evocative of the degree to which assembly is an important kind of right. And I suppose some Supreme Courts uh, would say that that's not the destruction of property, it's the freedom of expression. Yeah. Well, I guess this is a uh, uh, next question after that one. Uh, to what extent do you think that uh, the process of overthrowing Morrissey uh, was a mass movement, a popular movement, uh, perhaps simultaneous with it? To a large extent, it was a mass movement. Uh, what were those people so angry about? That, that wasn't entirely clear from press reports. And uh, how, how could they be satisfied over the course of the next several years in a process that would, uh, would lead to uh, consensus in Egypt rather than just a return to enduring uh, the game? Um. That's a, another really good question, um, to which I'm not sure I have a good answer. Um, one thing that bothers me very often is the idea that ordinary citizens should have a very refined, I mean, I, not that I think ordinary people can't have refined civic consciousness about and complicated uh, understandings of the informational and, um, con con and other consequences of their actions. But I'm not quite sure that I believe that people who show up for demonstrations are required to plot out all the possible decision tree outcomes before they decide whether to demonstrate or not. Uh, somehow I think that's um, something that I find actually morally problematic. So th th I'm not trying to trivialize what you're saying. I think it's, a, it's very important here. So there's no doubt that the army used those demonstrations as a way of reasserting its own power. But there I think we need to have a kind of a different, I would say we need a somewhat different understanding of what the army has done. Um, when, when the army withdrew from overt control of political life in the early summer of 2012, ostensibly because Morsi was making it clear that he was the president and could cashier generals. The most, Morsi's own evaluation of that, and I guess, I guess this was a mistake from my point of view. Um, he and I, Morsi and I disagreed on this one. Um, he thought he was showing his actual power over the army. I thought the army was uh, agreeing to withdraw for its own strategic reasons. So the problem, it seems to me, is if we want to look at the events of June 30th, the question is, how do we want to look at the, what's, what, happened, what did happen over the last year? And here's, here's what my story would be. My story would, would look like this. In February of 2011, there was a massive uprising in a capital city that was so rapid that, in fact, none of the forces of order could quell it. And as a consequence, the regime was forced to step down unwillingly. By March, that had taken sufficiently large, had become sufficiently large that in fact the forces of order could no longer even defend their own public buildings. The, the offices of the Ministry of Defense um, were being taken over, people were taking it. At that point, I would say the kind of classical revolutionary equilibrium of dual power existed for a very brief period of time, and nobody in fact stepped into the breach. But I would say at that point, things were pretty much in the balance, and the army understood that. So from their point of view, the question was, how do you, how do you reconfigure public order, which I think is the major concern of the army. And they thought they could do it on their own, and the experience, I think, of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was they began to realize that they couldn't. So they needed civilians to be in charge of a government, uh, but they also realized that it had to be a government that they could work with. So I think they strategically began to retreat, and I think the guys that we now see in charge, um, basically, um, Sisi and uh, uh, Sinki, Sinki uh, made a decision strategically to retreat. I have no idea what the Muslim brothers actually thought was going on, but that's what I think happened. And I would be interested to know if in the Egyptian war college, um, they, as I think they do, learn about the need to engage in tactical retreats on occasion so that you can then overwhelm your enemy later. If they do learn about that, then that's something that political leaders in Egypt haven't yet quite figured out. 
how to accomplish. So I think what happened was a retreat. And indeed, it turned out that the situation they were in was too difficult for the Muslim brothers to resolve as the head of government. At that point, they probably should have begun to look for partners in some other kind of coalition. Again, this is not a moral judgment. It just it turns out that would have been, as, as someone like Bishri, uh, who is not, I think, a liberal leftist, although I think he is probably committed to the rule of law and in many ways to Egyptian participation in public life, um, would have said. And the problem was that because they didn't do that, they made it possible for this other institution, or these other two institutions, the judiciary, but especially the army, that had wanted to get rid of them to accomplish that. So, I mean, that that's what I would say was, that, that's what was going on by June 30th. And the demonstrations were pretty much, um, th that is the tough weed, and those kinds of things were pretty much icing on the cake. But the, the protests, in fact, represented real concern by large numbers of Egyptians about the situation as it was developing. And I, I don't know why, I don't know in what, in what way it wasn't appropriate for Egyptians to voice that dissatisfaction. It seems to me at that point, then it's up to the political elite to begin to respond. Okay. And I do think that Morsi and the Muslim brothers had a variety of ways that they could have responded to that. Although, yeah. By dissatisfaction, you mean with, uh, oh, just a uh, basic level of provision? Well, there, was, there, was, there, was, there were two different issues. One issue was the absence of, uh, of yeah, goods and services. So electricity, uh, blackouts, brownouts, uh, failure to resolve problems of water, the concern, which was certainly more stoked by the press about bread. But another set of concerns was a profound dissatisfaction with the role of the Muslim brothers in terms of local life. I mean, they simply were not very, they weren't very popular guys in, on a lot of the street levels. And going back to November, we, I mean, I, again, this may be just, maybe I'm too swayed by television, uh, but it seems to me that when you watch television in Egypt in November, you heard accounts of fairly low level but routine street fighting. And so this was a war of position between the Muslim brothers and their supporters and their opponents who were sometimes ultras, sometimes not, sometimes other local young guys, probably sometimes members of the mafia, sometimes members of the old National Democratic Party. But you know, all those people are out there too. I mean, it's kind of like the, the problem again of the old, the, the, the National Democratic Party. Um, unfortunately, the Falul are actually part of Egypt. It, it might be nice if Egypt was like Cuba and all of the Falul would I don't know, end up in Miami. There'd be this very vibrant Egyptian life in Miami alongside the Cuban life in Miami. But that's not how things have actually played out. And I don't think anybody has begun to figure out, I mean, besides integrating the Muslim Brothers, which is going to be a real problem for any political leader in the future, there's also the problem of how are you going to integrate those people who are supposed to be the defeated remnants of the old regime? They're also still pretty powerful. And that's part of what that, I mean, part of that victory for Shafiq and Menofia is that. But they're not, they're not going anywhere either. And you and I may not, I mean, many of us here may not like their politics, but they're still not going anywhere. And if you're not going to try to get rid of them through some form of revolutionary action, how do you, uh, and I, this is not a rhetorical, this is, I guess, a kind of a rhetorical question, but how do you integrate those people into a political process? The uh, initial attempt by the Muslim brothers was to deny their leaders political rights. But that, that's not a very workable solution. It, in, I mean, it didn't turn out to be a workable solution. Yeah? Well, why did the U.S. Uh, label the recent uprising of the coup with the law and act of California a state department secretly like, happy about it? Um, I think it's a, yeah, I guess, I don't do foreign policy, but my guess is it's probably a bad idea for the Congress to lock presidents into foreign policy decisions that they might not want to undertake. So I understand why Congress passed that law, uh, which was an attempt to lock the U.S. into not supporting military coups against democratically elected uh, presidents, and I can see that as a very plausible and good foreign policy um, approach, but obviously the Obama administration decided they didn't want to have to do that. 
And so um, not only is he a, a well-known constitutional attorney, uh, he has lots of good legal advice. So obviously someone explained, someone figured out that if they didn't call it a coup, then they didn't have to obey the law because they had never made that determination. I mean, substantively, it doesn't seem to me it's a mystery. He, you, you may disagree with his decision about whether we should withdraw aid, and I might disagree with that. But once he decided that he didn't want to withdraw the aid, then the transparent, I mean, he had two choices. He could either just disobey the law or he could pretend that the law didn't apply. And since we have the rule of law, he decided to pretend it didn't apply. I, Is there any hope? Uh, go through the list. We always ask, is there any hope? So here's, you know, this uh, a focal point of uh, the struggle for democracy in the world. Uh, is there any hope? Could you describe the most hopeful trajectory that you think has a chance? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, well, I, I'm told I'm always actually very hopeful, even in the worst of circumstances. I mean, yeah, it seems fairly clear that this government can't actually be as thoroughgoing as it would like. The military can't be as thoroughgoing as it would like. And it's accepted, um, some people would say it's political cover. I would say it's accepted a political coalition of people who are not particularly favorable toward military rule. So it seems to me the military government has recognized, even if only partially and unwillingly, some limits on its ability to return to the situation of the 50s or 60s. Uh, Perhaps it's going to look more like the 80s. That's why I said to you, perhaps it'll look more like Brazil. Um, so in that sense, it seems to me we're not looking at the total, er given that the events of the last couple of, last three months have been, I mean, a, a wave of often hysterical um, anti-Muslim brother sentiment, anti-Americanism, occasionally even uh, anti-democratic sentiment. Nevertheless, it seems to me that there remain a significant number of Egyptians, uh, human rights organizations, which are still surprisingly still active. Uh, usually when the military takes over in a coup, they don't let the human rights organizations continue to function. Uh, usually they don't let people, and people get shot on the streets for demonstrating. If someone like Ziad Bahadine uh, proposed a month after the coup that there be a reconciliation, usually that person would not still be in the government um, two months later. Um, I'm not even sure they would necessarily be alive. So does that, does that mean that the army is going to, General Sisi is going to wake up tomorrow and say, oh, I made a terrible mistake, we should now, no, I don't think so. But it does seem to me that there is a remarkable resilience among the Egyptian people. So I, that, sense, that seems like a good thing. And it also seems to me, as I said, that the basic way of talking about politics today, unlike 1952 and 1954, is not that we don't want democracy or democracy isn't suited to us. That's what we're getting from the outside. The same people who've always, I hate to, I always sound, I, a Saudi prince once accused me of being an Egyptian nationalist, so I, I guess I'll, uh, take some pride in that. I mean, the same people who hated Egyptians and thought they couldn't be democratic five years ago still think they can't be democratic. It's just that the reasons, all that's changed is the reasons, but the conclusion has remained the same. Whereas it seems to me that there remains, in fact, a fairly significant number of Egyptians who want democracy, who want to be able to engage in political life, and the problem is, how do you get there? And I don't think that's an easy, there's no easy answer to that from my point of view. Not very many places have figured that out. So I, in that sense, I'm hopeful. Great note to end on. So thank you for your insights and finally your hope. Thank you.